Uh, welcome, everybody, to uh, session three. Uh, so we have uh, we have uh, um, three uh, speakers. Uh, actually, more than we have three talks. More than three speakers, and we have a discussant. The time is 15 minutes each. Uh, the, uh, the, the first uh, uh, talk will be presented by Georgia, please. So, good morning. I'm Georgia Simeoni from ISTAT, and I will present you our first reflection, I will say, on the quality aspects to be taken into account using mobile network operator data, so MNO data, in official statistics. This is the joint effort of a, a wonderful team. I will not read all the names, but uh, I, uh, many thanks to all of them. Uh, so maybe I can uh, go f quite quick on the background ob objectives because uh, um, Fabio Ricciato uh, introduced uh, several of these uh, uh, things. Uh, we know that uh, MNO data are, have a lot of potentialities, that uh, several uh, case studies, experiments have been already carried out and that ca they can be useful in several domains. Uh, they can uh, help us uh, improving timeliness, reducing costs, uh, maybe, uh, and improving relevance uh, since uh, we can produce maybe uh, more indicators uh, or uh, um, more detailed statistics uh, with them. Uh, but the big question is uh, on quality requirements that are very strict for official statistics and are not only a matter of accuracy, as we saw uh, from the uh, speech of Fabio, we have all the uh, quality principles of the code of practice to be fulfilled. Um, so we do not have uh, uh, the answer on how to fulfill uh, all the uh, quality requirements, but uh, we can start analyzing uh, uh, systematically what are the issues and uh, uh, we would like in the long term to build a comprehensive quality framework for this uh, uh, official statistics based on MNO data. So how we uh, started? We started first uh, identifying the peculiarities of this uh, data uh, and uh, of the process uh, to produce statistics with this data uh, and uh, we, what differentiates them for more traditional data sources and uh, obviously the impact on quality. Um, we, uh, in this uh, uh, presentation, in this paper, we uh, consider the MNO data as uh, um, all the data re the, um, related to the location of the device uh, in, uh, in the network. Uh, so we have basically event data that are data uh, generated by the mobile devices, uh, so the data from the uh, calls uh, from the text messages and from the connection to internet that are, um, that are um, called the CDR and they are voluntary uh, actions that the user of the uh, mobile device uh, uh, made and other signaling data that are the, uh, all the uh, not voluntary activities uh, of, the, of the user. Uh, that is the network that uh, uh, exchange signals signals to, to establish a connection with the device. Uh, we are t talking about SIM, about this uh, uh, sub subscribed identity module that are in the device. So we have uh, big data and we have uh, confidentiality issues uh, because uh, this data uh, remain personal even after pseudonymization. So we have these uh, uh, two characteristics. Then we have network data 
that are then data on the antennas, uh, on uh, where they are, uh, what type of data they are, and this uh, is the base for the algorithms to identify the position of the device. Uh, and this is a first uh, source of uncertainty because uh, even with this very um, detailed data, nano data, uh, are they called, we have uh, a lot of source of uh, uncertainty that uh, arise during the, uh, the process uh, to produce uh, statistics with them. We do not consider business data, no uh, data from other uh, apps of the, of the device neither uh, uh, social demographic information on the contracts, let's say. Uh, so, what are the main peculiarities of uh, uh, this uh, data? Uh, I, I only repeat something that has been already said in uh, these days. They are privately held data, so they are uh, generated for different purposes than uh, statistics, like administrative data. They are generated out of the National Statistical Institute, like administrative data, but they are also produced out of the National Statistical System. So. Uh, uh, they are not subject to, so, to some binding legislation, let's say. In addition, uh, due to their big data and confidential nature, uh, very often uh, we are not able to process them, uh, at least uh, in, the very first, in the first part of the processing, in NSI, but we have to rely on MNO. And we receive uh, pre-aggregated data, usually. Um, so, not, in this case, not only data generation is out of the control of the NSIs, but uh, also part of data processing. Another thing that is different is that uh, we are not a statistician very used to analyze um, the software and the algorithms that are uh, uh, implemented in uh, the, the um, uh, software that we use to process data. We Quite, are quite confident that uh, they are uh, good enough, let's say. In this case, uh, these different differences uh, in uh, software and in algorithms used uh, can have also a big impact on quality. So, this is uh, so only to, to understand the um, um, let's say, the uh, situation. Uh, but how we did proceed in the quality framework? Uh, first of all, we considered the consolidated quality framework, starting from the code of practice and the quality assurance framework, but also some methodological framework for quality, so uh, the total survey error approach and its extension, the Blue ATS project and other uh, um, projects related to the quality framework for administrative data in official statistics. Then, uh, obviously, we also consider the relevant experiences uh, on quality of this kind of data, of MNO data. In particular, we referred to the ASNET Big Data 2, um, but not only. Uh, then we are actively participating in some uh, EU-funded projects that are, was, are already um, introduced by Fabio, and we are also working at national level uh, to, um, to, to improve the, uh, the, the, the usability and the quality of this uh, kind of data with the national projects. Uh, so, what is the structure that we think uh, this quality framework should have? Uh, there should be a, a, some aspect that some quality requirements at institutional level. We have to understand uh, if the code of practice uh, uh, principle of at least of an institutional environment area uh, are uh, uh, applicable if we have to um, uh, to extend them or not. Please consider that the code of practice in 2017 has been uh, also uh, has been revised, but and also some reference to the privately held data have been included. So something is already in. 
Um, then uh, we think that for the part on the process and the output, we have to look uh, on uh, the detailed production process. In particular, we started uh, with the input raw data quality. And uh, since it looked like the, uh, main sim the most similar uh, approach, we um, looked at the uh, framework for the quality of administrative data, uh, and uh, we tried to take inspiration for it to evaluate the applicability and possible extension to the case of MNO data. Then we decided to follow the SNET Big Data 2 that uh, proposed a, a distinction between a lower throughput quality and upper throughput quality to dis distinguish two parts of the uh, production process. Um, one is to produce from non-statistical data some statistical data and the second one is to produce indica statistical indicators let's say so uh, in our situation the lower throughput quality refer to the quality of the process that is made by MNO um, in the premise and uh, this is maybe the more difficult and peculiar part of the framework to be developed uh, the upper throughput quality is the process that is made uh, by the NSI on this pre-aggregated level. And here there are challenges related to the integration with other data and to the methods uh, that we can uh, apply to improve data. Obviously, we have also to consider the issue to, to use uh, multiple MNO. For output quality, we think that the traditional quality criteria are applicable, but the way to evaluate them is not so uh, um, straightforward. Uh, the way to estimate accuracy is not so simple, uh, and also how to report them to the users. Um, and there is on, not only accuracy. Uh, we, are not, <laughs> we are not finished the framework. We are still at the very beginning. We analyze uh, the, the part on the institutional level and uh, uh, the input uh, uh, quality. And we only made some first, very first reflection on lower throughput quality. So considering the code of practice, uh, we use that uh, uh, to reflect to the requirements at institutional level. Uh, these are the principles of the code of practice at institutional level. And we think that the main issue are concerning the, uh, the, the the, the ones from the 1B to the 5th, because, uh, okay, professional independence, impartiality, and objectivity are important, but they are not uh, maybe affected by uh, this kind of new statistics. Um, instead, it uh, should be uh, very important to promote the cooperation with uh, privately, uh, private companies and MNOs in particular, uh, and uh, this can be done in reinforcing the coordination and cooperation uh, um, principle. Uh, then, obviously, the um, mandate for a data collection and access to data can be facilitated uh, with the legislation. We have already heard about the revision of 223 that is uh, ongoing. But in the meanwhile, or maybe also in parallel, because also afterwards it will be needed, we have to work to harmonize the plates for agreements. So we have to consider all the issues that should be included in these uh, agreements. Uh, we need documentation. We need uh, uh, transparency, reproducibility, and so on. Uh, but uh, we also have to assure uh, um, businesses the confidentiality, not only uh, uh, the, the confidentiality of the citizens, but also the confidentiality of the uh, companies uh, that uh, need to be reassured on this. Um, then, uh, concerning commitment to quality, I don't think that we need to, the, to change uh, principles or indicators in the code of practice, but we have to develop ad hoc methods for the quality monitoring and assessment of this kind of uh, data. 
for the input quality, we uh, borrowed this uh, framework from quality of uh, administrative data um, that was developed by uh, DAS and other in, tw in 2009 and then um, further developed in uh, uh, international projects in which we have hyperdimension, dimension, quality indicator and method. And uh, this is an example. Uh, we have uh, one upper dimension for uh, input uh, administrative data is metadata. One dimension of metadata is clarity. One indicator of clarity is uh, the uh, presence of variable definition. And the method to evaluate uh, is the, uh, a score that can be um, applied to the clarity of the definition. OK, we, we didn't go uh, far to till the methods. We only analyzed the hyperdimension and dimension. Uh, the hyperdimension are source, metadata, and data. For source, the dimensions are supplier relevance, uh, privacy and security, delivery and procedure. This is from the um, approach of administrative data. Uh, we analyze all of them, uh, of them and their applicability on uh, our case. And we see that uh, for supplier and relevance, we can uh, apply them uh, in a uh, uh, straightforward uh, way in, uh, in this case, while for the other three, um, uh, privacy and security of input raw data is uh, on the end of a menu, uh, but uh, we have and delivery and procedure. We have to consider this part on um, when they uh, provide us uh, the aggregated data. So it's like uh, we have two input data, one is the raw data and one is the aggregated data that we uh, will obtain. And so maybe we have to consider different dimension to evaluate the quality of uh, this two type of input. Um, then for metadata, obviously all the characteristics, because we need metadata, <laughs> every kind of metadata on, uh, on uh, the, the process, on the input the, uh, raw, raw data, and uh, on the data treatment that they did on, uh, the, on the data. Um, we need uh, information on uh, the events and variables in the raw data, uh, but uh, there is a different uh, uh, in, um, interpretation on metadata comparability, because metadata comparability is on the issue of uh, um, uh, understanding if uh, uh, the metadata, the, the, the definitions used in uh, the, the input um, data are similar to statistical one. In this case, uh, we know that they are not the same. We have to build uh, this uh, uh, proxy uh, definition or this proxy quantities uh, to the transformation uh, process. Uh, then, uh, concerning data, um, we have technical checks, accuracy, completeness, time dimension, integrability. All the dimensions are relevant. Uh, technical checks are applied uh, by the MNO, but we should um, set up this collaborative dialogue to give them an indication on, uh, on which check they have to apply. Um, then, uh, concerning accuracy and completeness, uh, we know we know that we have uh, uh, under coverage because some uh, um, in, in this moment we are already thinking due to statistical output. So we know that we have some under coverage due to uh, the, um, uh, the, the that part of the population is not covered by phone. Uh, we know that we have uh, some uh, duplication for people uh, holding two SIMs. Uh, we know that we have uh, issues with uh, uh, measurement error because uh, it's not, uh, um, we have a, so a source of uncertainty when we try to localize uh, a device. And also in the time, uh, uh, we have some uncertainty because we have different uh, events, but we have to understand what happens between one event and in another one. So. This is for input, the first reflection, and we hope that you will give us other suggestions on input quality. Um, for throughput quality, we have so only some uh, first uh, ideas. Um, we think that uh, it's important to set up uh, a 
One minute? Okay, it's two slides, so it's okay. Um, uh, we have to set up uh, a collaborative system with, uh, with the dialogue with MNO and NSI. Uh, we need the documentation of everything, of the process, the methods, and the algorithms, and the software used. And uh, uh, the third point is already an improvement action. We have to promote standardization of the process. Uh, we can do it uh, supported by enterprise architecture uh, because standardization will imply uh, already uh, an improvement of the quality. Uh, obviously, then we have to understand all the errors. Uh, so we are to analyze the process in a total survey error like approach. This is uh, the very first part that we have worked on. It is a long journey. Uh, our next steps, obviously, is to develop all the other things. So all the uh, measures and mitigating actions for the lower throughput, uh, as well as uh, for the uh, upper throughput part. And uh, what our output quality analysis should then be focused on accuracy, clarity, comparability, and coherence. I stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Let's uh, move on to the second uh, talk. It's, um, it will be given by Magnolia and uh, Alex. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Lichun. Um, so we will uh, switch data source, and we will only concentrate on the input phase. Um, that means here sources, like web sources, so mainly websites. So that's um, the thing we will look at, and we will look at it through kind of two different perspectives. The one perspective is we kind of set up a web scraping process. So that's the landscaping part, and the source stability part is if we, can, we are kind of the user of an existing date, web data collection uh, product or, or database. Okay, so um, the first perspective, we set up a web scraping process. So, I mean, of course, you have websites, and you have a couple of them for a topic, and the first idea or if you kind of try to test it is you just scrape it and collect all the information you want to to collect um, but um, already before um, we thought about it in detail we were aware that we have to think about what we actually scrape so which websites are relevant to the topic um, can they be accessed are they stable and so on so this part we call landscaping and we see more and more that it's quite a crucial part of the whole of the whole process. Obviously, if your input is not good, it's not stable, then I mean the output will not be great at the end um, after all as well. So we thought about landscaping. What is it? And we came up with a de definition. So landscaping comprises all process steps necessary to catalog all relevant sources for a specific topic of interest to measure the quality and technical viability of the catalog sources and to select the sources which are actually used um, based on, on some measured criteria. So there should be some kind of quantitative um, criteria to select which sources should be um, in it. Um, so we kind of um, derive the process. So we catalog, we measure, and then we select. And at the beginning, we thought, okay, that's like, okay, you catalog everything, then you measure, and then you select, so that's quite linear. But, I mean, we saw that it's not linear. You measure something, then you go back and, and, and um, look for new sources because everything you measured is not of good enough quality, and you have to find a, a alternative ways to, to capture information for the web. And also, the, uh, the select phase is, is closely connected to the measure phase. Um, so it's not linear, but it's also not a problem because most of our processes at the end are not linear and we have a lot of feedback loops in, in like GSPPM is not linear, um, all our production is um, with feedback loops, so um, also in this case we have to think about it in, in this way. The, the different steps, um, 
for different pro pro projects uh, or use cases are quite different. So there is um, like the, the simplest example we could find is for uh, like energy prices. Um, we have a website in Austria by, by the regulatory body that collects all the prices from all energy companies. So there's one website you have to scrape. So you are quite quick in the catalog part. Um, the measure is just like you check if you can actually scrape it. I mean, in this, this example, it's, 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 everything is really easy. The select uh, step is obviously also quite easy if you have just one source. Um, a more um, demanding example is um, where you have like a, many websites and you want to scrape them exhaustively. Um, so that's an example for like honor based enterprise character characteristics where we have like a NACE definition of the population and we want to scrape all the websites from them. So that's the, the cataloging of all the websites. So finding URLs for all the statistical units, that's quite a lot of work. So that's um, the, the, the kind of the heavy part of the um, endeavor. And also you have to measure if you can actually scrape it, um, if it's like the correct website, so if you can actually validate that the URL is connected to the, to the statistical unit. Um, then there's the, like, the prominent example of online job advertisements. There are, I mean, there's also cataloging and measuring involved, but there, is, there are a lot of portals and like the, the most challenging part might be the selection because you cannot scrape 100 portals um, and it might not be a good idea to scrape 100 portals, so you, you have to limit yourself to a certain subset of portals um, with some um, like a effect, uh, objective uh, uh, as an objective as possible measure on the, the quality and the representativity of the selected sources. So these three steps, um, let's, let's look at them a little bit in detail. So that the catalog in part, we saw two dimensions that, that uh, are influential there. So um, does a topic of interest require to find all the websites for a relevant topic? So that's the example of the online-based enterprise characteristics or a list of representatives, price statistics, um, OJA, uh, so online job advertisements. Um, so that's um, one dimension. The second dimension is, is the additional information available beforehand? So that kind of an input um, for that. Um, for that process. So in, in the um, enterprise example, that's like a business register, you, so you ha actually have a list of all units and you want to scrape the list. In another example, this, this drone industry example from, from uh, Pete Das, so you always have to um, cite Pete in every presentation. Um, <laughs> um, so the other example from the drone industry, it's not like that, why is it different? So the drone industry is not just one NACE, you can limit yourself to a business register so you don't know beforehand the list of, of enterprises. So you have to kind of find the information which uh, company um, is in the drone sector. Um, it's not as easy as typing into Google because there's quite some pitfalls. So it depends what search engine you use, where you, you which computer you use the search engine um, from, um, and so on. So it's it's this, this step seems trivial, but it's it's not at the end. Um, the measuring part uh, is is quite broad. So there are like technical blockers, let's say. So if robots are blocked, if there's capture on the site. That, that could be blockers, um, but there's also, um, you also have to look at the information that's available on the website and if, if the information you need is actually available there uh, with, with sufficient quality. That's the point where I hand over to Magdalena. So thank you. Um, so we are at the moment at the step. We have cataloged the websites. We have done some measurement but now, for the situation that we want to find uh, a subgroup of uh, websites and not to scrape all, we have to select. And when we look, for example, at the OGA example, um, you have several job portals. And these job portals have different characteristics. One might be very popular, the other ones you know. Yeah. 
you know, uh, for example, the operator, maybe it's a public um, job uh, service, which is very reliable, others might not seem that reliable. Then the third one has the big advantage that the information there is mostly structured. Structured information is always a, a, a plus because otherwise you have potentially to classify uh, which has errors. Um, and maybe another one has a lot of original ads and the others only have copied apps, ads. So there's a lot of criteria, there are some job portals, and the moment you look at it like this, it shouts out like, this is a multi-criteria decision-making problem, right? Uh, and the good news is there have been a lot of work in that di uh, direction, mostly from operations research, and you can choose from a lot of models uh, which help you here to do a profound and um, transparent decision. So how do multi criteria decision-making problems always look like? You have alternatives, these are the job portals. You have criteria, this is the characteristics of these um, uh, job portals. And then you need a model which produces, rank, which produces a ranking, a best alternative or a ranking of alternatives based on the values of the alternatives for each criteria. And this is what we do have here and it helps to cate categorize uh, the problem like that. So, uh, in our case, when we look at job portals, we identified three groups of criteria which could be taken into account. There is, first of all, information from the website itself. Uh, the technical criteria, the uh, variables which are on that, uh, the information, is it structured versus not structured, is the information up to date, all this stuff. Then the second group is, is there information about the website? Like, what is the market share of this website? Is the rank, uh, when you do a rank of Google, re uh, Google search, is it um, popular in that direction? Does it cover some niche markets that other uh, job portals do not cover? Or, um, yes, can it be linked to the business register? Is the, as I said before, the owner of the website, is he or she reliable? So this is information about the website. And then we have identified a, three, a third group, and the third group is experience. Maybe you did some test scraping and so this is a website which is not that stable. Um, maybe you did a prior round of scraping. Maybe you're already in the field for several years. Maybe you have seen here the results are very stable and here you don't know why, but the results are not stable. So these three groups should be taken into account. These are the criteria. And then there's a lot of models. And we even within the ESS NetWin, where we are both in, um, we have seen the two uh, very different um, selection models. I would say one is an extended weighted sum model. The other one is more uh, advanced. It's for OGA, they use the analytical hierarchy process model. Um, we look at both of them very quickly. So the course of action is easy. You need to decide on the group of information, the criteria you want to take into account. You need to take, uh, to choose a selection model. You do, um, calculate the score and rank their websites and you scrape the best ranked websites. So what happened within the uh, DSS NetWin? There is uh, use case free, it has different use cases. Uh, what do they do there? They scrape mostly prices of the real estate market, of hotel prices, of online prices, of household appliances. And they developed, which is nice, a standardized um, uh, selection model which uh, covers several uh, use cases. Um, so what they took, uh, in, they only considered criteria from the website, no external information. They took into account stop criteria and minimal criteria like robots blocking, capture, is there filter criteria, is the content up to date. They looked at mandatory variables for each use case. They said, these variables we need to have there, otherwise we do not take into account this website. And they have a, a, optional variables which they would like to have. It gives in the model some kind of plus, but it's not mandatory. Um, so the selection model is pretty easy. They said uh, the score is zero if one of the stop criteria of mandatory variable is not fulfilled and the rest is just the sum of the fulfilled criteria scaled to 100. Uh, so this was their selection model. In the case of OGA, it was a bit more advanced. Uh, they used two building blocks. The one building block is, as I said before, an analytical hierarchical process, and the second building block is um, 
some kind of qualitative assessment of the source's relevance. I go into detail a bit more. So for the first building block, they used a lot of variables of different um, quantitative and qualitative uh, variables, which is nice. You can do in an AHP model um, a mixing of these. So for example, type of the portal. Is it a primary portal? Is it a secondary portal? Then the type of the operator. Is it a recruitment agency? Is it a, um, a national newspaper? Things like that. Then the volume displayed, um, the sectoral scope. Is it one or is it more? Uh, and the structured field is well, how are the information presented. So this was uh, information that went into the AHP model. And then it's, it's a pretty advanced project because there have also been different roles, like one of these uh, ranking did Eurostat, the other one was done by, by country experts. They also included criteria like popularity. Um, it was measured by Google Trends. Uh, it included some kind of stability, uh, which they knew from previous um, uh, rounds of scraping, the access to the stability of the access and the stability of the time series. And um, they included some kind of coverage. Our, um, does the, the, the scrape data cover the, um, the market in a similar way as known data? So all these uh, building blocks Combining together resulted in a final score, and according to this score, they decided on the websites of on the job portal to screen. So, we have put ourselves all, all from until now. We looked at it from a user, uh, from a producer's perspective. How do we landscape? How do we decide on the sources? Now we switch roles. As we were in the ESS net, uh, in the ESS net, we are more in the shoes of the users. We can access uh, the platform and download microdata on job portals. And from a user's perspective, everything lo looks a bit different. You, maybe you know a bit metadata, how the, the producers decide on the sources, but mostly you have the data, you see the sources inside the data, and then you should also do a bit of a quality assessment, how well did the landscaping work out in the end? And I'll give you a quick view what we saw from a user perspective. So we identified several quality, as, uh, quality criteria, and they look a bit easy from the, first uh, from the first perspective, but they are not that trivial. So just imagine you get uh, microdata about uh, online job advertisements. And you see in that microdata, those, those, and those sources were included. So the first question is, are they indeed the relevant ones? Ask your country experts. I ask the people who are in the labor market and ask them, would you have chosen the same portals? Is it the ones that you identify as the important ones? So this was a very qualitative criteria. The next thing is, just follow my thought in that way. What you actually want to do, you want the OGA data to tell you something about the dynamics of the labor market. You want to know, are there more vacant positions? Um, and you, you scrape. You have selected fantastic portals. You scrape. You build some kind of indicator, some kind of index based on the aggregated data. Uh, and then you suddenly see the index falls. So does it mean that the, the number of vacant positions falls? Or could it be that maybe one source fell away? So the existence of the sources, the same sources over the whole time series, is a very important indicator. And then a bit more advanced, just imagine you have chosen five portals and the indicator rises. Does it mean that the number of job vacancies rise? Or does, could it also mean that one of the portals became much more popular? Uh, and uh, you, you capture another effect than you actually intended. So you, it's difficult to identify exactly the effect, but at least you can try to look at some ranking. Is the ranking of the most popular uh, sources stable, or do the um, popularity switch all the time? So that's what we did uh, from a user's perspective. And we can say, um, this is a picture of Austria. We, so what we did is we, we a, a nice advantage of the hub, the pl platform that we is that you can access the data for all countries. So you can run standardized and reproducible quality assessment for all. I'm almost finished. 
um, what, you, what you can see that sources fluctuate wildly. This is not only Austria. What you can see um, here is, do we have a laser? Yes. Um, for example, here, this was the source of Suna, which we lost access to. They were a very, very prominent source in the middle of the time series, and then we lost access. So an indicator based on all these sources would have pretty much problems. And then, for example, here, the golden line is the Austrian public uh, agency, where we do not really know why they have lost so many OGAs. They say that the, the number of OGAs is increasing. So we see pretty much fluctuations, and we are a bit skeptical if it actually captures the real job market dynamics. So this was my, from a user's perspective, and thank you for your attention. Ah, there is, there is a summary. Yes, this is all part of the quality guidelines for acquiring and using web data. Um, uh, it's, not, it's still in a drafting phase. Um, I think we can share it in, informally. Um, and yeah, take away, please look systematically at the sources they count. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, then we move to the uh, third talk. It will be uh, presented by Anthony and assisted by Calvin. So, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, can I get the clicker there? Can I get the clicker? <laughs> Thanks. So yeah, my name's Anthony Dawson. I'm a statistician in the Consumer Price Index area of the Central Statistics Office in Ireland. And yeah, I'm just presenting on sort of our project to assess the quality of transaction scanner data for use in the CPI. So yeah, just a quick overview. Um, transaction scanner data is generated by points of sales terminals in shops. So basically when you go to the tills and it provides information kind of at a barcode level um, transaction data sets usually contain product quantities. Um, there should be sales, total sales as well for a time period, as well as retail information for the products over a period. So that's sort of, um, yeah, what department of the shop they're in, you know. Milk is in the dairy department, which is in the fresh food products, stuff like that. So, you know, tran transaction scanner data, it's not something new or innovative, really. It's been around for quite a long time now, I think, in uh, official statistics. So I suppose then just an overview of kind of c grocery price collection in the consumer price index. And it, it can really be broken down into kind of two periods, well, three, I suppose, but there was before COVID-19 hit, which was the, the old method of collecting price data. It was 100 prices all around Ireland um, using a specially developed uh, mobile app. To just go into shops, collect the price of, uh, you know, the, the groceries in the shops and send them back to the office where they were all collected. And in terms of the grocery price collection, there was no alternative data sources. It was just this manual pricing done by the, the 100 prices. COVID-19 hit, uh, forced to withdraw the prices from the field, so there was no more going into shops. Um, that, you know, so we had to find new sources of data for CPI very quickly. Uh, this included sort of web scraping, so that was automated um, using you know, web scrapers and also manually collecting price information uh, from websites, just staff who w used to edit and do checks on the 100 prices. We're now just going on to websites and writing down prices into an Excel file. We asked some supermarkets for price files and they provided them. And one supermarket provided us scanner data. And I think Ireland went into lockdown in March 16th and we were able to still produce the March CPI um, in April, which, you know, it, but it was a lot of work. So I suppose post COVID, you know, same as everything, you don't go back to the way it was before COVID. I think it changed an awful lot of things. So, yeah, post-COVID, only 30 prices returned to stores, um, mainly in the, the big cities, Dublin, Cork, Limerick, Galway, with a couple of others uh, scattered through the country towns. Um, we continued pricing in the offices, so the staff as there was, there was, you know, they were only doing 30 prices instead of 100, there was, there was capacity to continue doing 
a reduced amount of pricing in the office but still using prices in the office. Then statutory instrument was upgraded to allow us to request scanner data from retailers. Um, this came into effect last year. So I suppose the state of play where it is now is scanner data is being collected from three retailers, uh, supermarkets that is, um, and one more is coming online in 2024. So this accounts for sort of four of the five major supermarkets in the Republic of Ireland, and I would be very surprised if we got the fifth, because they're a pain to deal with. Um, so the new sources of scanner data had to be assessed for quality. We had no assessment structure in place. I suppose this is the key point. It was quite a lot of fun actually creating a CPI from a load of different data sources out of nowhere in a small space of time. It was fun, it was innovative, it was innovative, it was fun. But at the end of the day, the, we had no assessment of you know quality really of what we were doing. We were just trying to get a product out there. So it's clear that you really do need, and you know, we've seen it all day today and sort of it was touched on yesterday that you know you do need to assess the quality of these new innovative innovative data sources. So, yep, um, the Vorberg Group is a service price statistics group. Um, I think they hosted, uh, ISTAT hosted it in 2018 uh, in the Hotel Queen Alley. So, I was um, a member of the, the Vorberg Group for a while while I was working on SPPIs in, in the Irish Stats Office. And as part of that, um, I, was tasked, I was on a task force which sort of developed a questionnaire to assess the quality of data for fitness of use. And we developed this questionnaire based on the GSBPM. We kind of took a look around at what everything, everyone was doing, you know, within Europe and sort of Stats New Zealand, uh, StatCan, a few other places to see what the best was. And we came up with this questionnaire, which is say based on the GSBPM. It suggests measures that can be taken to assess and mitigate risks. Um, and it just allows you to kind of go step by step through, ask yourself questions, you know, it, it, I, it does come up with sort of a good method of assessing an alternative data source that fits in with existing data source assessments. So you're not doing something that's completely at odds with what's already being done, I suppose is the best way of putting it. So seeing as I was working on it, uh, I determined that it was the best method of assessing alternative data sources. Um, and there's a link to the paper there. So on the next slide, what I have is just an example of one of the many questions that you can be asked. And I chose this one because it's, it's pertinent to the question around scanner data. So this is in the collect aspect of the GSBPM. It asks, you know, is there sufficient consistency across records in the file to meet your needs? And it has a number of things that you should probably take into account, you know, report on birth and death, stability, response, volatility, it's stuff like that. So our answer to this question was that, yep, scanner data has a constant flow of products entering and leaving the data. There is no record on, on the scanner data file of what is a new item or what has been replaced. So this must be tracked by us instead. And this is a thing about alternative data. You do not have, to, a, to an extent I suppose, scanner data especially, you do not have a sense of being able to mark things on the data set, you just get the data set the way it comes in. So we decided, yep, it was worth tracking these, the number of items in a data set from week to week and querying with the supermarkets if there's a large number of new products or items replaced. So that again, it just means that we're not being surprised when we go to produce our CPI release that, wait a second, we've got a whole bunch of new things that aren't being compared with last month. We can see it quickly and easily. So, yeah, I suppose the conclusions we drew then from that GSBPM, I suppose I said now, so it's, it's questionnaire, is that we, we did it twice. We analyzed the data when we first sort of had our initial conversation with the, um, with the retailer. We did an initial assessment of the first data set they sent us. And then after a number of weeks, we revised the questionnaire. We revised some of the answers to the questionnaire. So the initial evaluation determined that, yeah, we could possibly use it for CPI. Um, we created an analysis tool for longitudinal analysis, temporal time, um, 
just to you know to, just to assess this really and a final evalua evaluation confirmed that the data was suitable for use. However, from that final analysis, we you know we made a recommendation that we do continue to ana analyse the data based on every transmission that we get in to track these new items, missing items, and other metrics. And it has allowed for the quick flagging and resolu resolution of potential data errors. Just, I think, two weeks ago, we had, um, we had one of the retailers send us the same data for three or four weeks in a row. So we were able to flag that quickly and just say, look, you know, what's going on, and rectify that. So, yeah, so as, as I said, we're kind of, we are doing an ongoing assessment. Um, Calvin has been working on that um, as part of his role in the CSO. So he's just going to take a quick guide through of the sort of the ongoing assessment. Uh, thank you very much, Anthony. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's great and all to have uh, like a seal of approval for suitability of use of this data for CPI from an initial assessment. But again, as was pointed out, and as is the nature with scanner data, it's kind of a necessity to have an ongoing assessment for it. Um, as was pointed out in the example question that was shown, like there was a good few items coming in and out, and so it was necessary to kind of track that. That's just the nature of scanner data. Um, and I suppose uh, Fabio touched on that in his talk this morning, especially with private data, which this is, you know, it's prone to change. And I know there's, uh, there's kind of a hope that there would be communication between NSIs and private institutions and whatnot. But it's not always the case, so they're not always going to report when they make a change in their data or they change some way, whether their collection, their methodology or whatnot. So that's something we need to be reading the data for, whether it be week on week, month on month, just over the course of a period, well, just ongoing, that this needs to be checked. Um, so yeah, I suppose another thing that uh, Fabio touched on was that it was Oh, it's slipping on me now, apologies. Um, but, oh yeah, that this process should be somewhat automated, well not somewhat, but it should be an automatic process, that it should be able to appear straight away if there's an error in it or whatnot. And um, I suppose, considering it's scanner data that we're all familiar with it, if we can't make an automated process in accordance with this assessment tool, it doesn't really look great going forward in more complex private data. So, fortunately that isn't the case, that like, we can it was rather simple to put in a, a successful uh, quality assessment tool. Like Anthony mentioned, we were able to catch any, well, it's, you can never say you catch everything that's going on, but we do catch stuff that should be caught. Like we mentioned, the fact that they were sending us the same data week on week, we could see that straight away, just that duplicates were starting to appear, that we could report back to them, hey, this is going on, is there an explanation, can we get it ratified before publishing and whatnot? So, that's the advantage of doing all this. So we developed an R Shiny app that can do this. Again, like I mentioned, it's a fairly easy process. And the big advantage of it is that it's very easy to f just change slightly or add in bits if there's something you decide, well, this shop is doing something funny. Let's start tracking this now. And we can see then if this is OK or not. Like, you can do it in a couple of minutes. Like, it's simple lines of code, and that's all it is. Um, so we're tracking kind of general data quality metrics. First off, so stuff just like missing data, um, negative values, stuff like this could come either through the method of data transmission, so how it, we ingest it or how they send it to us between different file conversions and all that. So that's stuff that can be eliminated from analysis like this. But then, of course, because it's scanner data, that's what we want to analyze. We want to analyze like how suitable it is as scanner data. So as was mentioned, you know, we want to be able to rely on these barcodes, whether there's duplicates coming up, what's the explanation behind that? whether items are leaving and coming, we want to check the significance of these items, whether it's small things, uh, or if it's these big sellers that are suddenly there one week and gone the next, and suddenly they're back. Or even this barcode, like if you're not getting the G10 exactly and you're getting a different barcode, do you want to determine how trustworthy is this? Like there's a legal um, ruling on GTINs that they can't be reused, but who's to say with barcodes and whatnot, like suddenly a shop could just bring in an item three weeks later, that's a completely different thing. And if you're using barcodes as your identifier, suddenly you have a completely wrong identifier for that. So this is stuff that you want to be tracking ongoing. So, uh, yeah. so this is just kind of an example of what we can be checking for and kind of how our, our Shiny app can look. Um, again, it's quite plain. It's all you want, really. Like, you don't need anything with bells and whistles and whatnot on it. You just want the information. That's it. So you can see 
a list there of everything that you kind of would want to be checking, like how long something is in the data set, how much unique stuff there is, when stuff is coming in, when's it coming out. And then you can see there, like you can set your own parameters as well. Like this is stuff that you can add in fairly quickly if you want to see it, like straight away, you can change your significant price upper and lower if you want to say, like these are all checks that are done when the data goes in the CPI anyway, but this is just a good initial check. If suddenly the entire data set has doubled in price, there's obviously a big issue there or there's something major going on that's of concern. Um, so this is stuff that you can relay straight back to the uh, data provider before you even start putting it into production and have to catch these issues then and there. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much all the work that was done on um, the ongoing basis. So I'll pass it back to Anthony just to wrap it up. So yeah, uh, thanks, Calvin. So I've, I put questions in here. I suppose it's not questions. It's uh, my final remarks is that, yeah, what we've done is we've shown that scanner data is suitable for use in CPI. Well, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, that's nothing new, but it's not, it's more about the process. It's more about putting in place a process that allows us to take any form of alternative data and question whether it is suitable for use in the consumer price index. Scanner data is just the first thing. Um, as I say, we went from 100 prices down to 30 because of COVID. I can see the very near future, us not having any prices in the field. It, all the information coming from alternative data sources. There is regulation coming down the line that requires us to get inform or price information on uh, games of chance. So in Ireland, that would be gambling. That is data that's got, probably going to have to come from uh, the gambling companies themselves or we web scrape it. We don't know. This gives us a chance. This tool allows us to assess which one is the best fit, which one gives us the best quality of use. So I mentioned yesterday there is an ethics question as well, and ethics does play a big part of that questionnaire, and it, we kind of go into it more detail in the paper. So yeah, that's kind of that's kind of where I wanted to present it is, yeah, let's say it's for scanner data now, but it, my plan is that it will be the sort of the go-to assessment tool for sort of quality of as alternative data. So yeah, uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Anthony and Calvin, for also for excellent timing. Uh, now, uh, discussions by Natalie, please. Okay, so I'll go over this quick because I really would like to have a discussion on the floor. Um, so I read the uh, three papers. Uh, so just to pull out a couple of um, things that I've said on the papers and, uh, and then talk about the commonalities and some observations and then we can open the floor for discussion. So paper one was about the MNO operators. Um, it was very interesting, the sort of uh, assessment that you did there wasn't necessarily about the other papers where we were trying to put that into our quality frameworks according to the um, ESS. Um, and uh, I liked the, um, um, oh, sorry, that, the mobile network app, sorry. I'll start over. So the quality assessments uh, needed to include the stages of preparing the MNO data. And so here I like the fact that they were using the quality framework of the ESS, but they were expanding it into other uh, well-developed quality frameworks, for example, from Pete in the Bluets project, uh, the fact that they were uh, looking at institutional level, input level, the fact that they were separating the uh, input process between that coming, you know, pre-processed from the MNO and then uh, processed within the agency. Um, so you talked a lot about conceptual and qualitative descriptions of the quality at different levels, but I didn't see any quantitative metrics. Um, and then given the pre-processing requirements within the MNO, one output quality dimension that I didn't see was transparency, but maybe you mentioned it. I mean, I, as I said, I only read the papers, so I didn't um, go over the presentations. So, sorry, it was this one, the landscaping web data, which gave really incredible uh, information about selecting uh, websites for scraping, but not in the framework of the other papers, which is on the quality assessment. So I think that 
that still needs to come. Now, I noticed that you sort of had two different scenarios, whether you're gathering information through web, scra web scraping from an existing frame of units, or whether you're trying to identify the target population in the web scraping. And I think that that would likely suffer from selection biases. So I think in the framework of official statistics, it would likely be you know, trying to web scrape from exist an existing frame to try and keep it more in a probability-based scheme. And you could also subsample that randomly, whereas in the other approach, you would probably need to do some sort of quota or, <clears throat> or cutoff sampling. I did like the use of the uh, ML methods to facilitate the selection of the URLs. I like that. I like anything quantitative. So, uh, so once the data is ingested, again, you need to think about the quality frameworks as in the other papers. You gave two test cases, uh, again, using online job advertisements with websites that were predetermined from Eurostat, and you've developed this really nice score, and then you, you know, scrape the ones with the, uh, well, in this case, it was small scores, I think. But. Um, and then you had the other test case where you were selecting websites systematically according to the checklist of characteristics. And, and this is the one I'm really worried about selection biases because it obviously requires good meta information of the website. And, and the fact that you say if it blocks robots or if it has a CAPTCHA, we immediately discard it. You know, so I'm really worried about um, selection biases here. Um, and then you had the sort of characteristics, zero, one uh, characteristics aggregated to, to, to be able to rank these according to some sort of mandatory set of variables. Um, now, the paper three is pretty much well established. I know there's a lot of national statistical institutes looking at uh, price data. Uh, and I, the quality uh, assessment, again, is in line of the, with the standard ESS quality framework expanded to deal with this type of ingested data. I really like the longitudinal aspects that you're looking, uh, you know, <clears throat> the fact that you could detect uh, duplicate data, I think that was really uh, commendable. Um, I would have liked to ha hear more about sort of, because there was at some point that you did manual and the transaction at the same time, and it would have been interesting to hear a little bit about the quality assessment on, the, on that sort of um, test that you had. Again, risk mitigation, if the stream of transaction data suddenly stops, what happens? This will also come back in my, <clears throat> my sort of overview. And again, no, uh, well, and actually your paper didn't have that nice uh, quantitative methods, but you, yeah, very nice. So you showed uh, uh, the dashboard where you're trying to look, think about um, the uh, sort of quantitative quality assessments. So my commonalities and observations. So my main concern uh, that given a production pipeline application, uh, data that's ingested from private organizations like can suddenly be stopped. So what do you do? What, what is the risk uh, mitigation that needs to be done? And I think the agencies really need to think seriously about that and how they can compensate for that problem. I think there needs to be more work uh, to understand the representativeness of ingested data, particularly coming from uh, private companies. Uh, the, tra uh, the transaction data web scraping has been sort of uh, looked at a lot of um, National Statistical Institute, so I think that's a bit more uh, in practice. I think the MNO data, we definitely need to look at uh, the, and understand the coverage of these operators and how to compensate for errors. The quality assessment needs to include checking the stream data longitudinally, so actually you did that and that was very nice, and it should be done in a system, systematic matter, so it's not just about the cross-sectional what's happening in the data on hand, but actually producing time series and looking for breaks in those time series. So producing quantitative metrics over time I think is really important for ingested data. Uh, and as I said, to distinguish between one-off checks or ongoing checks, and this all has to be part of uh, the uh, dashboard, uh, quality dashboard, when you're ingesting data. Now, I think there needs to be more research into quantitative metrics and to produce a quality framework scorecard. And I had one thought about all of these conceptual frameworks that were brought in, especially within the hyper, di hyper dimensions. You know, if we could sort of attach to each of those some sort of Likert type scales, then perhaps we could do a, piece, uh, um, a PCA or a principal component analysis, or something to get a quantitative analysis on the, on the uh, quality and that we can compare different products. 
So um, that's uh, what I need to say. And then the web scrape data, I think, also needs to think about the ESS quality framework and how that needs to be expanded to account for that type of data. So we can open the floor to discussions. Thanks, thanks, Natalie. And uh, wait a little bit with the questions uh, from Natalie. But uh, let's. I would like to collect if there is any question from the web first, uh, from the online. No. Okay. So uh, the quest floor is open for questions uh, from the audience present. Your Ilya is ready, right? <laughs> Also, if we could get uh, the reflections from the discussion from the authors. Well, I, I would like to maybe collect some questions first before before the. Uh... Okay. A question to Alex Maldalena. So you, I think you show that um, the Eurostat uh, platform for web scraping, with whom I'm not very much familiar, but it seems that you were able to audit it from externally, right? And isn't <coughs> basically isn't this? a brilliant and shining example of a infrastructure that the ESS is uh, building or prototyping that is audited. And you have identified very serious point for improvement, but do I conclude that you can then now suggest um, improvement, suggest how this um, glitch, I think it was a clearly a glitch or a point can be fixed and isn't this part of a quality cycle, independent auditability of a shared infrastructure that thanks to this audit, audit from you and others could grow and improve and improve quality? I mean, is it this a, a nice thing or not? And uh, can we bring back the questions, the last questions that, uh, that on the screen, please? I don't want it to be disappeared. I just want to collect some questions and give the authors a chance to answer questions. Maybe there are several questions overlapping. They could address them uh, in a more reasonable fashion. Uh, the questions by the discussant. Uh, so other, other people have other questions? Uh, the model doesn't work. I hoped. <laughs> I mean, the question come, and then the authors could maybe answer several questions in a more considerable way, rather than every question per se, and, and sort of going like this. But that requires the more questions coming, otherwise the scheme will reduce to the old. Uh... <laughs> okay, then, uh, I'll, I'll give the floor to the authors. Let's go by the uh, sort of the uh, um, order, yeah. Okay, thank you to Natalie for the comments. Yes, so we miss uh, quantitative metrics. We are still working on it. Uh, as I said, uh, these are all first reflections. So we will arrive at, uh, to hopefully <laughs> to proposal for quality metrics on uh, the different uh, um, components of the framework. Um, concerning transparency, uh, we gave some um, importance uh, on the transparency of the process uh, for carried out uh, by the MNO data, uh, and we maybe only mentioned the clarity as a dimension of uh, the output, but uh, for sure we uh, take on board this comment uh, to emphasize more the importance of transparency also for the users. Um, the issue of the coverage of uh, different operators is quite clear to us <laughs> and uh, uh, I have to say that we are involved in the um, also in, uh, in the ASNET uh, that uh, starting now on, uh, on the integration of uh, uh, data from uh, an MNO with other data and uh, we really hope that there will be uh, a joint effort to uh, improve this uh, maybe lack of information on, uh, on these aspects. Thank you. Um, thank you. So on this, this, this selection bias question, I mean, definitely, I mean, we will have a selection bias with any choice of websites. Um, but I mean, if uh, if we sort of, I think the first masterclass about non-probability sampling, we are there. If we kind of choose uh, five websites or whatever number of websites, 
Um, I mean, but we, uh, we hope that A1 and A2 is true and we are all fine when, by applying the methods. Um, I mean, we, we have to, to check that somehow systematically. Um, in the discussions, we, we, we currently are calling something statistically scraping, which is closer to what we do. So we draw like we, we start from the units and then then we kind of just scrape the units and get the information, not by, by serving them, but by scraping them. And that's, that's much easier because it's controlled. Um, uh, that's, of course, the ideal way. In some um, areas, you can do that. I mean, if you start from the enterprise, you can always, like, that's the unit. If you start from the online job advertisements or actually, like, what you're interested in is the job vacancy, I mean, that's not something you, you have in the list. You, you sort of, that you cannot sample the old job vacancies and then scrape them, so that's not possible there. So you have to go another route, and that's kind of non-probability sampling, um, and then you tr try to end up with something that is not too biased, I would say. Um, sh should I reply to the auditing, or do you want to reply to the auditing? So, Uh, so thank you, Fabio. I completely agree with you. That's a great thing that we as users can do a standardized report for all the countries. It was well, the moment you set up the, the framework, uh, it was easy to do it in a standardized way. This was great. Um, I think one of the challenges here, which we will have to address in the future, is the, um, the question about responsibilities. Um, it's, it's a very new setup that as an NSI, we are the users of the centrally produced uh, data of another agency and uh, another institution. And the, other, the, the selection of the sources is not in the hand of the NSI. So, um, so this, this way forward, I, I do have the feeling at the moment the NSIs get the data and they, uh, they can understand, okay, these and the sources were selected, but the information, if there is some kind of instability in the source, if a source falls away, if, if the fluctuation is so high that, or like in our case, the public um, job agency, as an NSI, we have the contact to them and they say our amount of OGAs that we publish grows, but the web scraping showed something different. Um, if the responsibility for the sources would be in the hands of the NSIs, it would be easier to correct them than when the landscaping and the selection of the sources is also centrally managed. This is a bit of a takeaway uh, I, I saw here. But I mean, a centralized infrastructure is one thing. A collaborative infrastructure is another thing. So I, again, I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the work that my colleagues do, so please understand that I have a limited understanding. But I would have guessed that it's natural as an ESS shared infrastructure. And as I am not just consumer, but can all improve, suggest, take responsibility, we may have a system for collecting suggestion for new web scribe, uh, web scrapes. It's, uh, to me, it looks something that if it was not taught, could be added. And, and with these premises, I think it would be more useful for you, right? No? I, I, I think we totally agree. I mean, the, the picture you showed this morning about like this, this setup and that you have like feedback loop in between, we don't have that with you at the moment. And that's a legacy issue basically because you know the history, it's from CDFOP and they constructed the whole thing. And so it, it's, if, if we would have, would have started within the ESS setting up the system, we would have started probably differently and had this kind of feedback loops or like the expert from NSI is in there at the beginning, but it did not start that way. Like the, the, the system was just copied or transferred. So it, um, the knowledge on some steps is also not within the ESS, so not within Eurostat, but with external partners. So it's more difficult. So we actually are working on to getting on the, uh, in the at the moment it's, we are in the position as it is a, like privately held data basically. It's not that different. I mean, it's, it's nice because we have access to the micro data and everything, but we don't know all the stats, the, like the process steps. 
until we get the data. We, it's not transparent at the moment, but it's mostly a legacy issue and the like, process step by process step, it's improved, but it, we are not yet, the whole process is not yet transparent to us and I also don't think to Eurostat. Yep, yeah, I'll be quick because yeah, lunch was nice yesterday. Um, so yeah, the, just the comments that you kind of made uh, around the quantitative, yeah, they weren't available when we wrote the paper, but we're going to amend the paper sort of once we've finished up here and uh, we'll add in that quantitative aspect. I think you mentioned as well sort of the, the data shocks of if they would withdraw data. Yeah, that is a problem. Um, it's, we're, I'm kind of hoping that in, along with the transactional data from retailers, we'll continue web scraping to give ourselves a fallback if needs be. It's not as good. Um, they're not directly comparable either because with the data from transaction data, you're getting a unit price, whereas web scraping is a sort of a, a it's a it'd be a different price. You know, you don't get the offers on that. So that's sort of one one way of doing it. Another fallback then is to go with the manual pricing and fall back into that. So that's kind of that's kind of where we have at the moment. To say we don't really have any comparisons done between the two, and you know what the differences are. So that's that is work that we still have to do. But um, yeah, so I think. If that answers the questions, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, one more chance, uh, last chance for questions before we, uh, I mean, we, <laughs> uh, Anthony, what are you going to do with the last, uh, you have five chains, you are on the way to getting the fourth one, and the last one you don't expect to get it. What are you going to do with it? Um, yeah, we're going to take them as far as we can in legally, probably lose, um, and then um, we'll web scrape them. Yeah. Uh, uh, we're on camera, but uh, I suppose, yeah, they've, they've taken us to court a few times before over different aspects of our data collection in their stores and have won it, so we wouldn't have the confidence of winning it again. We, don't, we just don't have the resource to take them on, basically, they're, they're the largest supermarket in Ireland and they, yeah, so. This is, uh, this is, I mean, sensitive, this, because this is like, you're saying, you're saying that there could be, because scan up data from grocery supermarkets is like a, 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 is not a tricky thing in many countries, every country is doing it. And then you say, even with this type of data, Many countries have been using it for price index for 10, 15 years at least. And then you say even for this type of data, there could be one of the five chains <laughs> just refuse and, and, and beat us in court. I mean, if you talk about the reliability of alternative sources, then, then that's going to be an issue, right? This 20% this the selectivity coverage, what are you going to do? You cannot just shut close your eyes and say this is official statistic. I have to do something. Okay. Um, yes, let's uh, thanks all the